So I'd like to begin by taking us to a different battlefield, the Battle of Antietam, September 17, 1862. And on this day, an unlucky Union Brigade found itself deep within Confederate lines, cut off from reinforcements and assaulted from all sides. Lieutenant Colonel Hector Tyndale, a gruff Philadelphia abolitionist, led this unit, the 1st Brigade, 2nd Division, 12th Army Corps. And prior to the war, Tyndale had been a glass and porcelain importer and a friend of Mary Ann Brown, who was the wife of anti-slavery zealot John Brown. And actually, after Brown's hanging, uh, Tyndale was among the party that went to Charlestown, Virginia, to claim the remains, a move that was certainly not popular among even people in Philadelphia at the time, given Brown's acts of terrorism at Harper's Ferry. But in 1861, Tyndale helped organize a volunteer regiment in the Union Army, the 28th Pennsylvania, which served in Tyndale's brigade at Antietam. And almost to a man, the enlisted ranks of the 28th despised Tyndale's stern style of leadership. They considered him uncompromising, tyrannical, and insolent. And one soldier even predicted that if bullets fired by the enemy managed to spare him, the troops under his command would not. <laughs> These ill feelings, however, did not survive the Battle of Antietam. Tyndale's attention to discipline, while making him appear like a martinet, had in fact turned his brigade into a hard fighting unit. At 8 o'clock in the morning, his men punctured the Confederate line near the Dunker Church, and for the next five hours, they held a position similar to that of the famous Lost Battalion of World War I. It was lodged in the center of the Confederate line, far in advance of reinforcements, and repeatedly attacked by Confederate brigades that attempted to drive it out. As Tyndale later wrote, the punishment of the rebels was very heavy, destructive, and rapid. They finally broke from our continual and near advanced and after this hard pounding, with great loss, our own loss being severe. During the battle, Tyndale himself had three horses shot out from under him, but yet he remained on the field all the while, directing and encouraging his men on foot. But then at around 1 p.m. in the afternoon, a brigade, as his brigade expended the last of his ammunition, a final Confederate assault drove Tyndale and his men from their advanced position. And you can see on the map, uh, the position was kind of down here in what was known as the West Woods, uh, just west of the Dunker Church. Broken and disordered, the Bluecoats retreated east towards Antietam Creek, all except for a few courageous souls who futilely tried to defend the advanced position to the last man. Tyndale was among these, standing next to a haystack, asking his men to retire in good order. And as he turned to watch his men retreat, a Confederate musket ball slammed into the back of his head, struck his occipital bone, and then lodged in his neck between his jugular vein and carotid artery. He fell to the ground, unconscious. And uh, the, mo the place where that happens uh, is photographed there. You can see me uh, standing adjacent to the Maryland Monument. And if you ever go to Antietam National Battlefield, stand on the back porch of the visitor center and look out, you'll see that exact area where Tyndale was wounded. So what happens at that moment? Uh, one of the last of Tyndale's men who held that final line of battle, a corporal from the 28th Pennsylvania came running past. Recognizing his insensible commander, the corporal picked him up and began to carry him off the field. Pursuing Confederate infantry fired on him, a ball passed through the corporal's hat, knocking it off his head, Yet the soldier remained calm, he called for help, and a lieutenant from the same regiment turned back to help him carry Tyndale another 100 yards behind a reforming Union line. Uh, the two soldiers put Tyndale to rest behind a haystack where a surgeon met them and immediately extracted the ball from the colonel's neck. Tyndale awoke, severely dazed, deaf in one ear, and completely enfeebled. He saw the face of the brave lieutenant who had uh, joined them. Tyndale awoke after the ball was extracted from the back of his head, uh, and he faced the lieutenant who had carried him from the field. He was happy to learn that he was still in the land of the living, and for years afterward, Tyndale credited the two soldiers with saving his life, a life that he lived, incidentally, to the fullest. Uh, he never actually fully recovered from his wound, but he did rise to the rank of general. He ran for mayor of Philadelphia in 1868, uh, he served the U.S. Diplomatic Corps in London in the 1870s, helped to organize Philadelphia's Centennial Expedition, Exposition before finally dying from the lingering effects of his wound in March of 1880. But he spoke to a group of Union veterans in 1871, remembering his rescue at the Battle of Antietam, and he said this, The two rescuers, even here, acted like true soldiers. 
He declared, while in full retreat and almost surrounded, our comrade, Lieutenant Borbridge, seeing me fall dead as he supposed, he stopped, turned in the face of a heavy fire, and with the aid of a corporal whose name is unknown, dragged my body to a shelter, from behind which, comrades, your accurate, firm, and persistent firing soon checked the advancing foe. And although Tyndale praised Borbridge by name in his speech, he never learned the name of the other soldier, the corporal who had been the first to reach him, all because that man had been the last to leave the field. So Tyndale's unnamed rescuer was Corporal Ambrose Henry Hayward, a Massachusetts-born needlemaker who moved to Philadelphia prior to the war. At Antietam, Hayward was 22 years old, but extremely aware of the grim dangers of the battlefield. Writing to his brother, Hayward spoke little about the daring rescue, for although he was a naturally courageous man, Hayward had little use for gloating about personal audacity. Instead, he ruminated on the site of the carnage and uh, said this, I went through the bloody battle of Sharpsburg, but how, God only knows. There was no one who had a more narrow escape than myself. A ball knocked off my cap and nearly took me from my feet. I put a hand up, saw there was no blood, and smiled. The loss in our regiment is 45 killed and 210 wounded. The rebel loss, very heavy. We laid them out in two ranks. The sights I have seen are too terrible to describe. I wish I could forget them. Now, Hayward's wartime letters are a resource preserved here at Musselman Library's Special Collections Archive. It offers historians an incredible window into the world of the Union soldier. Scholars are bound to reflect upon the Civil War as a national calamity. But we must not forget the importance of the individual, the personal experience produced by the war. In 1992, historian David Blight reminded readers that the outcome of the Civil War, the extension of freedom to slaves, and the preservation of the liberties of the free came at a horrifying cost. Blight wrote, the Civil War was ironic because it both violated and affirmed the 19th century doctrine of progress. It would become the source of America's shame as well as its pride. It would haunt, as well as inspire, the national imagination. A great illustration of this incompatible duality can be found in the Army career of Henry Hayward, one of the many thousands of constituent stories that made up the great history of the war. Like other soldiers, Hayward was a witness to unspeakable carnage, a shattering of the illusion of the pageantry of war. He built up many close friends in the Union Army, yet he saw these same comrades act recklessly and immorally caught in the throes of dislocating effects of fratricidal conflict. He watched close friends die in horrifying ways. He conversed with frustrated Confederate prisoners who saw their dreams of independence crumble around them. He hero-worshipped illustrious generals who ended up disappointing him. He snarled when anti-war editorials criticized the Army and the administration. He reveled as fellow soldiers took Southern Forge and freed Southern slaves. He was, in essence, an observer and a participant caught in the midst of two wars, one a physical war with the Confederates and another an inner war against the searing psychological horrors of armed conflict. And although Henry Hayward entered the war with the assumption that his own courage and high-minded patriotism would help his army secure victory, he acknowledged that the war was far from an exercise in personal glory. Hayward's worldview was unique in this regard, for his letters diverged from traditional Victorian sentimentality that limited secret disclosure or self-censoring of inappropriate material. Unlike most men of his day, Hayward hid little from his readers. He wrote about the war as he saw it, not how he wanted it to be. He let his primary audience, his parents, his brothers, and sister, read his innermost thoughts as they flowed unfettered to his pen and pencil. And although Hayward almost always stopped short of bringing back the full, grisly details of a world caught in the throes of violence, he openly recognized the ways the War of the Rebellion created this inner war for himself. The inner war of combatants is a struggle that scholars do not often see. But when it surfaces in the historical record, it reminds us that the fighting men of the Civil War not only struggled physically, but also with the values of their age and their own path to self-improvement. In many respects, Hayward's letters are portals that allow us to see that even among soldiers who exhibited powerful notions of duty, lofty principles of personal bravery, and a sustaining love of their country, such men could not ease the distress of having to watch humankind splinter itself so ferociously and so maliciously. I hope I am mistaken 
He once wrote to his father gloomily in April 1864, but I said at the beginning of this war that I thought this country had seen its brightest days. I do not think it will do to allow this war to live through another winter. Such pessimism did not necessarily eat away at Hayward's morale, nor did it force Hayward to disengage himself from the vengeful hyperbole of the hour. In the next sentence, he stated his desire to deliver the decisive blow. He wrote, I will hit old man rebellion in the head and knock his brains out. As insignificant as he may have saw himself, just one of thousands who filled the Union Army's ranks, Hayward possessed an acute understanding of his place in history, and like many men, he understood the urgency of his participation in this irreplaceable moment in time. So who was Henry Hayward? Precious little information elucidates his pre-war life. He was born May 21st, 1840 in North Bridgewater, Massachusetts, present-day Brockton, a town of 6,500 residents about 20 miles south of Boston. His father, Ambrose Hayward, was a dry goods merchant, descended from one of the earliest settlers of Plymouth County back in 1638. The family lived at 48 Green Street in the center of town. Hannah Howland Hayward, Henry's mother, bore seven children during her marriage, Augustus Melville, Hannah Corinna, or Cora, Ambrose Henry, or Henry, he's the middle child, Albert Francis, Julius Freeman, and John Parker. And only one of these, Julius Freeman, did not live past childhood. So the letters are all addressed to these two parents and then the five remaining Hayward children. Like most 19th century men, Hayward was deeply religious. At age seven, he joined the New Church, a mystical religion developed by theologian Emanuel Swedenborg. Hayward almost never mentioned his faith in his letters, which is a strange admission that I even today still struggle to explain, but fellow soldiers confirmed that he was an ardent New Churchman. His family, though, more than any institution, stood at the core of his existence. During the war, he sent letters to both of his parents and all five siblings, and his letters recurrently expressed an eagerness to remain informed about their lives. In fact, he treasured letters more than any soldierly trinket. In 1863, his sister Cora sent a letter to the wrong regiment, and Hayward was heartbroken that she had misaddressed this epistle, because he could never read it. He wrote, you cannot again bring your mind to bear upon the same subjects which were contained in the letter that is lost. I know it has done some poor soldier's heart good, for I always read yours with great pleasure. And this interesting scolding underscored the way that Hayward conceived of human thought, that ideas were formed in the exceptional context of their moment, and once they were lost, they were lost forever. The Hayward children were an active lot, and they struck out on their own and built out lives outside of North Bridgewater. Augustus, the oldest, moved to New York City where he became a clerk. The second oldest, Melville, moved to Williamsburg, New York where he became a lawyer. In 1864, Albert, uh, the son that was younger than, Hay than Henry was, uh, ventured out to Dakota Territory where he became a sutler and one of the first settlers of Sioux Falls. Cora eventually joined him there working as a teacher, although she eventually wearied of life on the Great Plains and returned east in the 1880s. Hayward left home sometime in 1860, and his letters offer only a few clues to explain why he decided that 1860 was the time to make his way in the world. That in 1863, he wrote to his sister Cora, and he said this, It has been nearly three years since I left my native place to go forth upon the world to find some peculiar place where my wild, discontented spirit could find repose. And since I have been in the army, I think I have roamed until I am satisfied. Now just before the war, Hayward settled in Philadelphia, a bustling city of 565,000 inhabitants. He moved into a boarding house at North Front Street and found employment at a needle factory owned by two former residents of his hometown. But he remained at this occupation for less than a year. News of the Confederate attack against Fort Sumter in April 1861 sent the Quaker city into spirals of anger. Eventually, so it seemed, everyone demanded military subjugation of secession. And Hayward was one of the many caught in the throes of this turbulent patriotism. On April 14, 1861, he wrote to his brother a letter that captured his zeal and sense of duty. So this is the letter he wrote 150 years ago today. Dear brother, my mind labors under a high state of excitement this morning. I confess it is too easily brought to that state. I've been reading the morning news and I see the black-hearted traitors, after commencing this unnatural war, exult and rejoice and make their boast that they will unfurl the palmetto rag over the Capitol at Washington and over Faneuil Hall. 
They at the South are slaveholders. We at the North are their slaves. Unless we immediately dispute every step they have taken against the federal government, it is not going to better this affair. An assault has been committed. There are wrongs to redress. There is a great lesson to be taught. South Carolina began this conflict and she should see it closed. She has commenced the tragedy. Let the Cass Act and the curtain fall. Invade the state with pure American blood and never leave it until it is left as waste and desolate as when the sun rose on its free soil 200 years ago. I have a feeling at times of late, kind of burning in my bosom, it may break out and perhaps induce me to take a step that I should hereafter regret, but not on my own account. For he who dares not come at his country's call is a coward, and I never answered to that name. Hayward's letter made it clear that he wanted to enlist right away and join the army of 75,000 militia called up by President Lincoln. However, Hayward's mother insisted that he think about this decision carefully, for she feared the army would use him too roughly. Thus chastised, Hayward waited, missing his chance to join the militia. But 13 days later, Lincoln made another call for troops, this time for 42,000 three-year volunteers. And with that, on his 21st birthday, Hayward enlisted in a volunteer company, the second company, Independent Grays. Writing on June 2nd, Hayward assured his sister Cora that he had not been compelled by foolish excitement. He contended, I will state that it was no sudden move, but an idea for a long while thought and studied upon when in the shop. I fully comprehend all the dangers and hardships and will submit willingly to my fate. On July 6, 1861, the independent Grays mustered into federal service, becoming Company D, 28th Pennsylvania. And this regiment was drawn from uh, across the Commonwealth, it had 14 companies initially, uh, from eastern Pennsylvania in the coal country to Pittsburgh. They had four companies directly out of Philadelphia itself. And they were bivouacked at Oxford Park, just north of the city of Brotherly Love. And there, the soldiers elected their non-commissioned officers, and Hayward received a promotion to Company D's 8th Corporal. On July 22nd, news of the Union defeat at Bull Run reached Philadelphia, and orders followed, sending the regiment to the front. On July 28th, after a day-long voyage, the regiment reached Sandy Hook, Maryland, where it joined a division commanded by Major General Nathaniel Banks. Thus commenced Ambrose Henry Hayward's military career. Over the next three years, he would fight in five states, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Georgia, and he engaged in about a dozen battles. Now, Hayward learned quickly that war would be no pageant. He spent the first seven months of his army service guarding the Potomac border in western Maryland, occupation duty that resulted in few pitched battles, but plenty of marching and sentinel responsibilities. Hayward and his comrades had to stand guard many hours, arresting deserters and suspicious civilians. Hardly something he expected to do when he first enlisted. However, he pleasantly surprised himself with his ability to endure these first rigorous tests of stamina. For instance, on the night of August 13, 1861, his regimental commander conducted a night march in which he got the regiment lost in the Maryland thickets. After a confusing trek of 23 miles, the regiment arrived at its destination at dawn, tired and footsore, and upon arrival, Hayward had to stand guard duty. Without rest, in stifling summer heat, he patrolled his beat without complaint, a personal achievement in which he reveled. But Hayward reveled less as certain other matters pertaining to camp life, particularly those incidents that shattered the illusion that war would follow the neat prescribed cycles of military discipline. Union soldiers along the border lived in a perpetual state of nervous anxiety, for they believed that Confederates might at any moment attack them in overwhelming numbers. The state of suspense resulted in a terrible tragedy in early August 1861 when an unnecessary camp alarm caused the regiment to form its ranks quickly and a soldier in Hayward's regiment mishandled his rifle and shot a comrade right in the side of the head, killing him instantly. And Hayward had to come to the conclusion that his regiment was in no condition to face the enemy. He wrote, we are disappointed in all of our commissioned officers. We are the worst drill company in the regiment. Hayward's opinion of higher level Union leadership changed as well. Early in the war, he was starstruck by the sight of stars on epaulets. He adored such generals as Nathaniel Banks and Joseph Hooker, leaders whose names are really now cocktail party jokes among Civil War historians. But Hayward respected these men because they looked the part of illustrious generals. He loved none so much as his first regimental commander, 
the well-known politician and later general John W. Geary. Early in the war, Hayward described Geary with unshakable reverence. He described the rush of confidence he felt when he saw Geary gallop into battle in a skirmish in October 1861. Hayward wrote, one thing now seemed to be wanting, some great head to lead us. He soon made his appearance, mounted on a horse, galloping at full speed. We now breathed freer, for we knew our cause was safe in the hands of Colonel Geary. But after participating in a few of Geary's poorly conceived battle plans, Hayward grew gradu gradually acknowledged his faults as a commander, and even began to see Geary for what he was, a mediocre leader who often indulged in shameless glory hunting. In 1864, Hayward remarks sardonically about a steamboat expedition conducted by Geary along the Tennessee River. When Confederate skirmishers shot at the boat, Geary ordered it to turn about. Unimpressed by Geary's lack of initiative, Hayward wrote home, Generals and their staffs do not like to fight aboard steamboats. They cannot go to the rear without taking their men with them. <laughs> Although he became increasingly critical of Union leadership, Hayward understood the difficulty of being a good leader himself. In 1863, he advanced to the rank of Company D's first or orderly sergeant, meaning that he now had the responsibility of drilling the enlisted men of his company. Hayward's greatest test of personal leadership came in September of 1863, when Company D received a set of 37 conscripts, drafted men, and substitutes called up by the nation's first Federal Conscription Act. Hayward struggled to train these men, for he had only six days before his regiment went on campaign. And the conscripts did not take easy to military discipline, and Hayward's frustration boiled over. Complaining to his sister, he wrote, The substitutes are among us in all their ignorance. You have no idea what a wretched creature a dumb man is. We have two out of our squad of 37 that we would call blockheads, both Irishmen of the pick and spade school. In addition to imparting military knowledge on men with dubious devotion to the cause, Hayward also had to keep the peace between the substitutes and veterans. Miscreant veterans played cruel, practical jokes on the newcomers. The experienced soldiers picked one simpleton out uh, of the rest, filling the poor lad's pipe with gunpowder, placing some tobacco leaves on the top, convincing him to light it, and then watching it explode. Hayward did his best to keep order in his company. Unable to put a lid on the hijinks, he had to take this substitute and move him outside of camp where he could get some peace. Goofball antics infested the Union Army, and Hayward did his best to moderate problems arising from poor discipline. However, in most cases, he could only stand aside and watch as an impartial observer. One of the most traumatic incidents of Hayward's Army career came in October 1863, when his brigade made an 1,100-mile journey from Culpeper, Virginia, to Chattanooga, Tennessee. All along the voyage, Union soldiers became uproariously drunk on the train. They assaulted Irish railroad workers who labored along the tracks. They smashed holes in the sides of freight cars, much to the dismay of the railroad agents. They climbed recklessly on the outside of the cars as they careened through mountain valleys at full speed. One soldier was struck in the head by a bridge, while another fell between the cars to have his legs crushed by the passing train. Hayward was standing in the doorway when this incident occurred, and he felt the sickening thud as the car bumped over the unfortunate soldier. He wrote, he fell between the cars, the wheels passing over both thighs. At this time, the accident occurred. I was standing in the door. I heard the cars as they jumped over him. When our car came to him, it was awful to feel the shock of the car, to see him laying upon the track, watching the wheels as they rolled towards him. He had a canteen around his neck, which I suppose was full of whiskey. Hayward could not understand why, as he wrote, Many of the brave soldiers who, for two years, have withstood hardships and escaped the enemy's bullets now became perfectly reckless for their lives. Hayward could not alter the behavior of his friends directly, but his strenuous effort to hold firm to amity and morality made him a worthy example of comradeship for his friends to emulate. By helping out soldiers in need, Hayward built a a uh, legion of friends in his regiment. In 1864, for instance, he loaned a sizable amount of money to a private in his company who was then suffering from the effects of scurvy. And this allowed that soldier to return home on furlough, recover from his ailment, and then return to the regiment. That soldier wrote to Hayward's father, declaring this, I am very much indebted to your son for using his influence in procuring the furlough as well as in loaning me the money to bring me home. I sincerely trust 
the same all-seeing eye will watch over him that has so mercifully spared and shielded him, your brave and generous son, through so many dangers. Undoubtedly, the Civil War put compassion and sympathy under siege, but Hayward fought back by wielding his own inflexible sense of decency and moral courage as a weapon against these terrible, depersonalizing forces of war. Whereas Hayward believed he could teach friends to endure the inner war on their souls through kindly acts, Hayward likewise believed he could teach Confederates the error of their ways through Union victory. Hayward's letters often described his interactions with white Southerners. Similar to his other worldly opinions, he exhibited complex emotion when he dealt with them. Early in the war, he tried to differentiate between Southern Unionists and Confederates. But as the war dragged on and no end appeared in sight, he became less concerned with respecting private property in the South, even if that property may have belonged to a citizen who harbored no secessionist sentiments. Hayward allowed his men to forage for provisions under limited supervision. He sometimes applauded the seizure of Confederate property. Yet, Hayward rarely insulted his adversaries, and he often, uh, and he, moreover, he offered surrendering soldiers all the usual mercies. However, Hayward spoke openly with prisoners or with nearby Confederate pickets on the war question. It seems that Hayward tried to understand the motivations of the enemy, but inevitably he concluded that, no matter which way he looked at it, the Confederate cause appeared irrational. A striking incident occurred at Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1863, elucidating Hayward's unflagging adherence to preservation of the Union. In this encounter, he met several demoralized Alabama prisoners, and he wrote, they, the Confederate prisoners, expressed themselves freely on the war question, admitting the hopelessness of their cause. They were very bitter against their leaders, especially the Alabamans. They told us the war would soon close with us, but to them there would be no peace until their leaders were exterminated. Hayward mentioned an interview with a Louisiana prisoner taken at the same battle. He continued, the most wretched among them was a little Frenchman belonging to a Louisiana regiment. He shed tears while I was talking with him. He could speak English but poorly, but I could understand enough to know that he had suffered much. He was barefooted and had been without food for several days. He said, I get two biscuit when I go to Lookout Mountain to last me two days. I get no shoe, no blanket. I go with Bragg no more. He played out. He took out a Confederate note saying, this played out too. These dialogues lifted Hayward's optimism. Rejoicing at the Union's military success at Chattanooga and elsewhere, he announced to his father they could not hold on to Lookout Mountain, which is proof enough that they cannot hold on to their Confederacy. Just as Hayward tried to make sense of white Southerners, so too did he try to make sense of their black neighbors. During the Potomac occupation, Hayward had plenty of opportunity to interact with contrabands, slaves who escaped to freedom by running away to Union lines. At every encounter, Hayward and his companions had the option of returning runaways to their owners or validating their newfound freedom. In all cases, Hayward sustained slaves' self-liberation. Hayward usually dealt with African Americans cordially. Like, unlike other Union soldiers, he never exhibited outright racial hatred. However, his writings often stereotype black people, portraying them as silly beings or social inferiors. In one instance, after Hayward had given up his gray uniform jacket to replace it with a blue one, he had no problem donating his old jacket to black camp followers, as many others in his regiment had done. However, he joked with the ex-slaves by telling them that the gray jacket made them look like Confederates. The purpose, it seems, was solely to get a rise out of them. Thus, Hayward's letters unveiled a complex relationship that some white Union soldiers had with slavery and race. Hayward was hardly a racial progressive, but he respected runaways' right to flee and supported emancipation before it became an official military policy. In actuality, Hayward wrote little about the Emancipation Proclamation, most likely because he did not see it as a controversial enactment. But Hayward expressed his political opinion more openly when he discussed the Copperheads, the anti-war bloc of the Democratic Party. Beginning in January 1863, Copperhead Clement Vallandigham, a congressman from Ohio, unleashed a tour de force against the Lincoln administration, arguing that the Union states could not defeat the Confederacy through military arms, even less through emancipation edicts. Vallandigham hinted that his state of Ohio might seek armistice with the South, a revelation that caused Hayward to seethe with anger. To Hayward, Vallandigham was a traitor of the worst kind, a northern rebel who stabbed Union soldiers in the back. In March 1863, Hayward wrote to Cora, 
declaring his wish to punish Vallandigham physically, perhaps murder him for his traitorism. Hayward wrote, it seems the good time has not yet come. They say the war must go on. I say, let the war go on till every traitor, copperheads and all, are made to kneel to the goddess of liberty. I believe that if such men as Vallandigham should come here and talk the way he does in Congress, the soldiers would kill him. We must have victory to give our troops confidence and silence the traitors in the north. When it came to politics, Hayward did not sit idly by and watch what he considered an abrogation of the Union war effort at home. Hayward took part in political discussions in camp that created a set of regimental resolutions, 11 in all, that castigated the Copperheads. These resolutions encouraged the people of the North, as they declared, to waive party prejudices, unite heart and soul in the suppression of treason and the maintenance of consolidated authority. They also condemned the Copperheads as traitors of the worst class. This shocking document, which hinted at violence against anti-war protesters, caused Hayward to reflect upon his personal conviction to the cause. Ultimately, Hayward saw nothing disturbing in violent reprisals pledged against the anti-war uh, populace by his regiment. To Hayward, these words validated his initial devotion to the cause. These are the original times that tried men's souls, he wrote. These are America's dark days, and if I live to see her pass through them and come out whole, then my fondest hopes are realized. In the end, however, Hayward knew that to bring America out of its dark days required victory, and that meant battle. For Hayward, battle was a frightening experience for which he never could find adequate language to describe. In his first combat encounter at the Battle of Bolivar Heights, Virginia, October 1861, he described it as an altogether awkward experience. Writing to his brother, he announced, I have not forgot the feeling that the first artillery shot produced. We all looked around curiously at each other as much to say, look out for your head. I never thought I should see the time when I should be dodging cannonballs, but I did that day. Battles left behind frightening visual reminders of the cost of victory, or of defeat, as it sometimes happened. While his pen flowed unfettered in all other aspects of military life, Hayward cannot easily bring himself to paint a picture of carnage for his family. After experiencing the bloodbath at Chancellorsville in May 1863, he wrote his father, this must be shortened to the point. I have once more trod the bloody field of battle, have again seen my comrades fall, and I have heard their dying groans. Yes, I have been spared, perhaps to witness the like again. Who ever read of such ter a terrible battle as we have endured on that Saturday night? The men's faces still bear the mark of terror. Hayward could not go beyond this. To help his readers understand battles, he suggested that they consult the bland descriptions of them appearing in northern newspapers. Only once did Hayward come close to speaking about a battle in all its gory detail. On November 27, 1863, his regiment participated in a horrendous attack against a Confederate unit perched on Taylor's Ridge, a massive acclivity in northwest Georgia. This is the last battle of the Chattanooga campaign. As the men fell, dead or wounded from Confederate fire, their lifeless bodies rolled down the steep, rocky slope until they lodged against a rock or tree. And during this battle, one of Hayward's close friends, Corporal Henry Fithian, it's unfortunate that I can't show you the picture because I have an image of him, uh, was shot right at Hayward's side, uh, struck right in the, the hip, and Hayward reached out to try to grab him so he wouldn't fall, but he missed, and Fithian's body went tumbling down the slope of the ridge, and Hayward had a difficult time comprehending this. He wrote this incident in a letter to his father, but stopped short of unveiling his full emotion. Hayward remembered, I turned away, dreading to see him roll down the mountain. I could tell you more of such tales, but it is as unpleasant for me to bring them back to my memories as it is for you to read them. It might seem as if this deliberate repression of painful memories indicated that Hayward had succumbed to the post-traumatic stress called by a world saturated in death, but this was far from the case. Limited to mere observations, though he may have been, Hayward refused to be victimized by the war's violence. He found his shield in, this frequent, in his frequent manifestations of his own courage. Throughout the war, Hayward followed a personal ethos that emboldened him to be the first to spring forward and the last to leave the field. Now the question of courage is a contentious issue among Civil War historians. Back in 1987, the historian Gerald Linderman argued that courage formed the cement of armies. And he suggested that uh, 
a privileging of courage showcased the failure of, of duty. A decade later, historian James McPherson reversed this argument, contending that duty, not courage, principally motivated Civil War soldiers. Hayward's experience suggests that these two ideas, duty and courage, may have been symbiotically linked. By using courage and duty as dual pillars of strength, Hayward fashioned the necessary fortitude to soldier on. This, it seems, was the key to Hayward's military career, affirming his devotion to his country with acts of unexpected bravery. In addition to his gallant rescue of Hector Tyndale at Antietam, Hayward also participated in an unusual espionage operation along the Potomac River that took a lot of courage and sagacity for the people who participated in it. This would take a whole another hour to explain uh, what went on in this, but you can read about it in the book. Uh, and he also participated in a Solaritus Union attack at the Battle of Chancellorsville. His officers marveled at these displays of gallantry. And in mid-1863, a lieutenant recommended him for the Medal of Honor, stating that Hayward behaved nobly, displaying qualities seldom found in a man occupying his position. His coolness is proverbial. Hayward rarely mentioned these moments of bravery to his parents and siblings. When he learned about the Medal of Honor recommendation, he shrugged it off as being inconsequential. To his mind, medals did not suit him. Still, he understood the integral nature of courage and its influence on his sense of duty. Even after the Battle of Taylor's Ridge, this frightening battle that claimed the life of his friend, Hayward remarked almost happily on the importance of deeds of daring. He told his father, it is glorious to be a soldier after the battle is over, when we have returned to our comfortable quarters to rest on our laurels bravely won, to think and talk of daring deeds we each and all have done, to show the narrow escape of the enemy's bullets. And it was this continual manifestation of courage that reminded Hayward of his unswerving commitment to the cause. In the wake of the bloody fight at Taylor's Ridge, the War Department offered all 1861 volunteers a chance to re-enlist and serve for three more years or until the end of the war. Even though the Battle of Taylor's Ridge firmly implanted the harsh reality of sacrifice to Hayward, that price was worth the victory. He and 15 others from Company D re-enlisted as veteran volunteers. On January 14, 1864, he proudly announced this decision to his father. They tell me I'm a veteran, for I have sworn to stand by the old flag for three more years, which means until the end of the war. I think I can hear you say, well done. If so, then I am satisfied. For despite the carnage, Hayward promised to keep fighting until he was dead or the Union claimed victory. Unfortunately for him, the former came first. Hayward's death came during the Atlanta campaign of 1864. On June 15th, while in command of his company, First Sergeant Hayward fell mortally wounded at the Battle of Pine Knob, Georgia. Army medical personnel transported him to a general hospital in Chattanooga. Once he arrived there, surgeons discovered that the musket ball that had struck his right thigh had bounced upward into his stomach and could not be removed. Hayward died of his wound on June 19th, and grave diggers committed his earthly remains to the National Cemetery in Chattanooga, Tennessee, grave 231. Heartbroken at the news of Hayward's death, his comrades in Company D organized a committee and drafted resolutions of mourning to be sent to Hayward's family in North Bridgewater. Lieutenant Aaron Lazarus, one of Hayward's many friends, sent a personal letter of condolence to Hayward's parents, reading, Hayward was a noble and true-hearted soldier, and his untimely decease is mourned by a large circle of friends in this army to whom he had endeared himself by his manly and courteous deportment. The government in your son has lost one of its most ardent supporters, one who had the interest and welfare of his country deeply at heart and whose sole aim was to render such assistance as would eradicate this unholy rebellion. Another soldier, Private William Roberts, wrote to Hayward's brother Augustus, and this man said, it may perhaps soften the grief of his family and friends to know the estimation in which he was held and to know moreover that he lost his life in the defense of our great and glorious heritage of freedom. With promotion awaiting him, loved and respected by all, he fell, but not forgotten, not unwept. His memory shall ever be respected and cherished by the gallant band of survivors of the 28th Regiment. These words may well have allayed the pain the Hayward family felt, but undoubtedly Hayward's sacrifice was paid by his family in the form of innumerable tears. In remembering the life and death of Sergeant Ambrose Henry Hayward, we are reminded of the inner struggles brought on by the war and the importance of remembering the Civil War's personal narratives. Nowadays, 
the study of Civil War soldiers' letters is an especially unpopular subject among academic historians. There are a great many published letter collections, but very few of them have been put together by academics. Uh, the Academy, I would say, finds interest in scholarly subjects so long as some vast sweeping uh, community is sort of involved, and this um, argument can be elucidated through a study of large bodies of people. While this is a fine policy for academic history, I often worry that it might cause us to forget the human experience of war. One person's life was as important as the next, and I'd like to believe there is some instructional value in analyzing the fullness of a single person's experiences during a time of strife, his hopes, his fears, his dreams, his successes, and his mistakes. In Henry Hayward's case, I contend that his letters leave us with a lasting impression about the inner conflict faced by all the Civil War's unfortunate participants. Further, the story of Hayward's bravery and sacrifice teaches us that there is some value in always being the first to spring forward and the last to leave the field. Thank you very much.